Our guest is the president of the Kenya Obstetrical. Did I get it right? Well, done. Eric has been having a problem. With his yes, yes. Can you obstetrical? Um, we can say obs <laughs> because most people say obs gaine. Yeah, yes. Buana. So the Kenya obs gaine society. <laughs> yeah, lunch up some yeah, no. I, I just got it, and now you start to remove. It. <laughs> okay, please go Kenya ahead. One more time. Obstetrical <laughs> and gynecological society. Okay. <laughs> the president is with us in the studio. We welcome him the way we welcome all our guests by giving him the day's proverb. Mm, this is our final proverb from the country of Angola. Mm. Charles all and see what destiny brings chance all and see what destiny brings cast your net wide your net wide mm, see what you catch see what Aim you for catch the moon and you land on the stars Abby? or you land on the moon itself or the moon itself <laughs> why not <laughs> or in another or galaxy overshoot the moon <laughs> <laughs> never know right chance it all mm. it's from angola from Angola. All so right. This is our final proverb from that delightful country. Mm. Yes. Dr. Kireki Omanua. Yes, sir. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you. Thank Welcome you very to much. the hot seat, one OBGYN. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. To my son and I have a story up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We are here because we want to talk about something that is a real uh, issue in our society. That's right. Every year in Kenya, 5,236 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer. Out of these, 3,211 die from the disease every year. And yet cervical cancer is one of those few cancers that are preventable through a vaccine. Absolutely. Now, let's first of all start with that. 5,236 diagnosed every year. A lot of women, unfortunately. That's a very high number. Absolutely. Maybe just to put it into, into context, mm -hmm. um, um, the cancer burden in this country is actually quite huge. The incidence rate, that is um, how many Kenyans actually suffer from cancer every year, is about 42,000, slightly over 42,000. And uh, the leading cause of cancer is basically breast cancer. And the second one is um, cervical cancer. Then we go to esophageal cancer, then colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and then all the others. Now, when it comes to the death, death rate, as you just mentioned, actually cervical cancer is the leading cause of death with um, slightly over 3,200 women dying every year because of cervical cancer. Uh, breast cancer ca comes a close second with about 3,107. Then um, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and then all, uh, all the others. What does that mean? Because when you talk about figures, sometimes uh, it may not give you that picture. That 3,211 women who die every, every year basically translates to about nine women dying every day. So every wow. day, somewhere in this country, there are nine families who are losing a mother. There are nine families um, whose children are losing a mother. There are nine families where a husband has lost a wife. There are nine families where um, sisters have lost a sister, have lost an auntie, etc. Et mm. and, uh, and then apart from that, we always say, wanjiko, wanjiko. So women are um, a very, very important pillar in our society and in our economy. So if you're losing nine women every day, it means that uh, the government also is losing in terms of taxes, um, in terms of social economic you know, support, mm. and so on and so forth. So it is really a very, very big problem in this part of the world and yet like you say this need not happen absolutely doesn't need to happen mm. completely because um, this is a cancer which is um, uh, is preventable but even before we go into the prevention part of it maybe you can look at um, what are the possible risk factors mm. of um, uh, of cervical cancer mm. according to research it has been shown that um, some of the possible risk factors of cervical cancer are number one uh, 
early debut in uh, you know having se having sexual intercourse mm. so when uh, young girls start having intercourse at an early age mm. um, most probably they will not end up having intercourse with that only one partner they will end up having intercourse with several partners mm. and uh, and i think the statistics which came out not too long ago um, showed kenya as a cheating nation mm. uh, that the men are having intercourse with an average of about 7.1 women in the lifetime in a exactly. lifetime and the women 2.4 so i don't know where this difference comes in either the men were embellishing you know uh, mm. the numbers <laughs> and the women were reducing the numbers we don't know because they did not actually add up but be it as it may <laughs> there is a problem that um we are having um, more you know um, uh, relationship you're having uh, intercourse with more partners than mm. uh, than we are supposed to and this is one of the leading causes. Yeah. Now, the lady can decide that, no, I don't want to have, I'm going to be, quote unquote monogamous mm. or I'm going to uh, just stay with one partner but the partner can decide to have several other partners out there and he can actually bring infection to this lady who has decided that she uh, is going to, to stay with with one partner. Mm. If you look at our statics, statistics again talking about the debut, early debut of, um, of intercourse mm. um, um, we have a very high incidence of um, adolescent pregnancies. You know about 200,000 over mm -hmm. the last, uh, you know, um, a period of time, mm -hmm. which is also not a good thing because this does not augur well for our future. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have uh, issues with smoking. Um, smoking uh, is one of the risk factors yeah. simply because it has a lot of chemicals and some of those chemicals have actually been found in the mucous membrane of um, these women who have uh, cervical cancer. Uh, the other risk factor is um, uh, delivering uh, uh, quite a number of children over uh, over a period of time. Mm. Um, our fertility rate uh, was in the in the 80s, 70s, 80s. It was about seven, seven point one children per per woman. This has dropped, you know, um, uh, stepwise. Now it's about uh, it's about four four children. Mm. Uh, but be it as it may, that is an average. But we still have uh, women who have uh, uh, a larger number of um, of children. Mm. Now what it has what has been found out is that um, these deliveries, especially when it's term deliveries, the micro um, um, uh, not infections, but um, uh, where when you deliver, you there are some uh, you destroy destroy a bit of the tissues mm -hmm. when the baby is coming out and if this continues you know every so often there is a chance that it can lead to uh, cervical cancer later on obviously there are other factors which have to come uh, come into play mm -hmm. infection sexually transmitted infections mm -hmm. like chlamydia like herpes um, and so on actually make it easy for the hpv virus which we know is is, is the main cause of, of cervical cancer mm -hmm. to actually actually um, stay in the, in the cervix and um, injure uh, the cells and lead to, uh, to cervical cancer. Um, uh, when we talk about the immune system, there are two issues here which we may need to underline. The first is where you have the immune system which is depleted, for example, in uh, HIV and, uh, and AIDS, mm -hmm. where we know that the immune system is not active. So it is a lot easier for other diseases to sort of get into the system and, and affect it. And uh, HPV is one of them. And it has been noted, and we see it actually even in Kenyatta, that um, um, these women who have um, uh, HIV, uh, get infected with uh, with HPV and their cancers are uh, a lot more drastic mm. than than a normal because if you have a young lady of 19 20 20 something years coming in with stage 3 stage 4 cancer that is uh, that is a problem mm. there are other patients who have um, the, where they uh, they have what we call autoimmune diseases mm. whereby the body sort of fights against itself they will also have a higher propensity of, of of, uh, you know having cervical cancer and then the most important thing which we need to uh, to underline and actually put it in capital letters is the HPV virus itself um, uh, HPV virus human papilloma virus there are many of them there are about 200 uh, subgroups but the ones which are virulent and have been proven to uh, lead to cervical cancer are group 16 and uh, and 18 and there are other adjuncts as well so there are quite a wide range 
of um, possible risk factors. Okay. You know, we talk of. Uh, do go ahead. I'm looking at cervical cancer and I'm looking at some of the things that you've spoken of. Yes. And again, the controversy surrounding the HPV vaccine. Um, because one of the things you did mention was the infection. That's right. Um, as now having been seen as a direct <laughs> cause of cervical cancer later on. That is right. Do we see then that with this vaccine, mm -hmm. There is also a direct prevention, in large or small part, of cervical cancer later on in life. Do, can, can we draw parallels between the vaccine and prevention? Absolutely, yes. Actually, the person who came up with this, um, with this theory and actually proved that uh, um, HPV, especially group 16 and 18, was a German gentleman and he was awarded a um, uh, Nobel Prize in medicine. And from there now, it has, we have picked it up that actually um, infection, and remember, uh, HPV, HPV infection is a direct skin-to-skin -skin, you know, uh, sort of contact. Mm. So yes, there, there is a direct um, a parallel between um, HPV infection and um, uh, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. And it has also been shown that uh, vaccination, mm -hmm. vaccin va vaccinating <coughs> um, uh, women, young ladies for that matter, actually has um, uh, uh, down downstream, as it were. Mm -hmm. It has a, a lot of effect in reducing uh, the cervical cancer rate. In 2018, the World Health Organization came up with what is called a 90-70-90 uh, sort of approach. And the 90 is basically to try and vaccinate at least 90% of um, young girls at the, at the age of, of 15 years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the 70 is to try and screen um, at least 70% of women around the age of, um, of 35 mm. and then the other 90% is to uh, to treat uh, the ones who have you no know, precancerous you know stage of cervical cancer and the ones who have invasive cancer you know to manage it okay. um, uh, in terms of screening we are not doing very well mm. because uh, in my practice I see uh, I see patients and one of the questions that I ask is have you heard uh, wh or rather when was your last pap smear mm -hmm. and uh, some of the the answers are quite interesting because most of these ladies are ladies who are well educated and they say well I've never heard about cervical cancer or pap smear mm -hmm. or um, the last time I heard it was was it maybe five years ago maybe ten years ago they don't remember like mm -hmm. they don't remember right. and uh, there is also quite a number who have never done it so we are not doing well my mm -hmm. colleagues who are uh, gynecological oncologists say the, um, the you know the screening rate is barely about five percent so we are not doing very well in this area okay uh, so, uh, sorry I know Sissi wants to ask us but look so many are, of us are vaccinating our girls between the age of 9 and 14 yes. right now and then getting the second dose and then you're done and hopefully that will provide some protection. But there was a lady who was sat in this very same chair where you are That's right. and talked about her journey with cervical cancer. She felt nothing. She felt nothing for the many years prior to when she did feel something absolutely and then by then it was at stage four she's okay mm -hmm. today yes uh, in remission for you know whatever interventions were taken mm -hmm. but isn't this the thing about cervical cancer that it is what is called the silent killer you will not know right. anything that you will not know that you have it mm -hmm. so does it not lend to this behavior that you speak of where nobody's getting a pap smear because mm -hmm. you know I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, I don't feel I don't feel anything. First of all, Paula Sanders was that lady mm. who um, who was here, and uh, you know she was diagnosed uh, stage three, stage four, which is quite late because by then it has spread to other to other organs um, um, of the body. Uh, sometimes it has gone to the uh, to the bladder, you know, to to the kidneys and so on. Mm. It is a silent killer, as mm. you said, because there are absolutely no symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. By the time the symptoms the symptoms actually start appearing, it is. Too too late mm -hmm. by the time you start having that watery discharge that um, um, you know uh, purulent discharge with a bad smell a bad odor mm -hmm. of rotting meat and so on by the time there is bleeding from the vagina you know in between the periods if you have a period uh, because sometimes uh, older ladies can also have this mm -hmm. uh, it is actually quite um, quite late 
so that is why we are insisting and we are um, we are talking about um, about screening mm. screening screening and screening because then we'll be able to actually catch these cancers at a very very early age and um, and treat them and the treatment actually when it's um, at an early age is very straightforward and survival rate is very very good mm -mm. city mm. now is your turn my turn huh? mm. <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, well, I have something like around 10 questions. <laughs> start but with the first one. Let me start with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> the incidences of cancer yes. in this country appear to have increased. Is it that we have more cases? Is it that we are able to diagnose better? We are able to determine the existence better? What is actually happening? Um, I personally think um, it could be a mixture of all of them together. Mm. Um, in that, uh, with the advent of um, uh, of the internet, uh, people are getting more information. Maybe that is one. Uh, with the advent of um, more doctors being trained um, and being spread out, you know, to the counties and to other places where previously they would not be there, or you'd have. Um, not very qualified staff. Maybe that is also another thing. Um, uh, our lifestyles have also changed. Uh, what we eat and what we do um, uh, is also a factor. Um, some of the foods that we eat and what is in those foods. Remember, um, agriculture on a very wide scale uses a lot of herbicides and a lot of you know pesticides, and some of these actually do find their way into into the food chain. And there is a possibility that uh, that also could be uh, could be a reason and uh, again the availability of um, uh, uh, you know medical centers and um, and so on that could also be a reason so i think it's a combination of all these together why is it that the discussion around cancer seems to center more on women are men not affected by cancer um, men are affected by cancer yes. and um it's um, sort of uh, a stigma in a way because uh, there are so many other things where women are the center of focus. For example, when you talk about infertility, even though 30-40% of the reasons of infertility are from the male side, it is the women who actually bear the brunt of, uh, of this problem. The same thing with, uh, with cancer, cervical cancer. But again here we see that cervical cancer is actually uh, the second most, um, most frequent mm -hmm. cancer which is, uh, which is diagnosed. Mm -hmm. When you look Look at prostate cancer, which affects most men when you come to the reproductive system, is further down, you know, uh, further down the list at around number four or number five. That is number two. And then number three, men don't like talking about, uh, about what is happening. Ladies will meet and talk about everything. They will talk about, you know, their heavy periods and their stupid husbands who don't listen to them and so on and so forth. But men, there is no <laughs> way we are going to sit and talk and say, you know what, I think I've been having something, uh, this something growing down there mm. and uh, these days you know i'm not as functional as i as i normally am you know and then uh, you have your, your your brother will tell you you know what let me take you to a urologist we rarely do that mm. that is number two number three we uh, take more care of our cars than our bodies so we'll find we buy a car, a brand new car, or even even if it's a second hand, we take it, you know, uh, for a wash every 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 weekend, and you know, and so on. We we polish it, but we really don't go for for checkups. That could also be another reason. So you're saying the care-seeking behavior, if you look at what is attributed to women and men, mm -hmm. could be a contributor. Very 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 possible. The data we have on cancer in women mm -hmm. is it from the visits? The normal scheduled visits that they make to hospitals so essentially it's voluntary it's voluntary it's yes. voluntary yes so we are then saying therefore that if i was to extrapolate what you've said mm -hmm. that if men went to hospitals more often for checkups the we would we the would we would diagnose more of these cancers mm -hmm. most probably okay. okay now why is it therefore then that with all the knowledge that we have mm -hmm. The preventative aspects of cancer treatment or cancer intervention mm -hmm. are not applied. Why? Why is it that we don't see it? We've got the numbers, yes. But 
why is it that what needs to be done isn't being done? And as you say, we in this country we train more healthcare providers than we can employ. We have more health facilities than we can count. So why? Um, I think it's um, uh, several several factors. Number one, information is very very important. Mm -hmm. um, what we are doing today is uh, is a very very good step in this in this direction. Um, uh, availability of that information and what we do with that information. Um, now that uh, January is a cancer uh, uh, cervical cancer awareness month, we've been talking about um, uh, about cervical cancer in different fora. Uh, we've been having uh, CMEs and so on. Such that this information gets to as many women as possible. Mm. What they do with that information is something different. But they need to know that, yes, there is a problem and this problem can be approached in a certain way. And if you come with this problem um, uh, early enough, it can be sorted, it can out. Be sorted out. It can be sorted out. I think mm. awareness is number one. Mm. The stigma, there is also the stigma about cancer generally, not only cervical cancer. Uh, most of the time when we hear uh, oh, an a cancer, uh, it is like a death sentence, yeah. which does not necessarily have to be so. Mm. So we have to destigmatize this um, uh, this issue. Um, we talked about uh, uh, the large numbers of, of healthcare workers who have been trained. Yes, in as much as we have these numbers, these numbers have increased. For example, right now we have about 20 gynecological oncologists in this country, which is a big step. Five, six, seven years ago, we did not have any. Mm. In some other countries in the region, they also don't have even one. So we are um, the government is helping in that in that in that direction. But then twenty uh, gyne oncologists in a country where you have a million of uh, where you have a population of fifty million, even if we say half of these are um, are women, it is still a drop in the ocean. Mm. So in as much as yes, we have more of this in terms of numbers, mm. we still have to train more. And then uh, um, uh, I think in as much as we may have all this, the most important thing is the prevention. So if we can emphasize on the prevention part, then I think downstream it will be a lot better. Let's take a break on that note. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Dr. Kireki Omanwa, President of the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. We are talking about cervical cancer. January is a cervical cancer awareness month. Doc, you've told us about the 90-70-90 strategy. Yes. Uh, vaccinate at least 90% of the population of young girls and women, right? Mm -hmm. uh, get screening of 70% of women and then treat those with prevent uh, pre-cancer at 90%. Let's talk about this screening. Yes. Are there other ways of screening for cervical cancer apart from pap smear? Yes, there are. Uh -huh. um, um, pap smear was um, was invented some almost um, almost 100 years ago mm. by a gentleman called uh, Papa Nicolau. Um, but uh, with the time, uh, other methods have come in. There is, uh, you can, we can, ladies can actually do an HPV screen. When you talk about screening, um, most countries, the strategies that they have is that um, uh, the ladies can do a yearly screening for three years. If they're all negative, then they can have it every three years. What other countries have is screen every three years. And if two of those screens, that is two consecutive screens are negative, then you can do every five years. Um, uh, in Kenya, that is the strategy that we have as gynecologists, as a society. That is what we are, uh, we are supporting. Um, but um, we still don't even have those patients coming mm. for those um, uh, every, every three years. Now, um, um, there are other methods, for example, there's what you call uh, via vili, whereby a patient um, comes um, to a health center and we look at the cervix and we apply a little bit of, um, of solution there and see whether there are any changes. If there are any changes, we take, you know, a biopsy straight away for, um, uh, for, uh, for analysis mm -hmm. or the patient is referred to, um, uh, to a specialist. Mm -hmm. Then there is the self-testing HPV kit, mm -hmm. whereby because women, some women have had um, uh, have had this screen and because when it comes to screening patient has to come to a, a, a healthcare provider we insert what is called a speculum into um, uh, into the vagina and um, uh, we look at the cervix and then we use a brush to get a little bit of tissue 
from uh, from what we call the external os of um, of the cervix the external os is basically the outside opening of um, uh, of the womb mm. now um uh, because of different reasons some of them have become traumatized and say i will never go back for another screen mm. you know and so on so they uh, uh, there is this self testing kit whereby a patient at the comfort of her home can actually insert a brush gently into the vagina and uh, the way it has been designed designed it can actually fit nicely into uh, into the cervix and um, get the material from there uh, put it in a solution and send it off uh, for analysis mm. so there are these methods which are uh, which are available the only thing is the the issue of costs especially with the self-testing one and um, um, the cost can be a little bit prohibitive and that is why it is not very available now when you do the HPV self-testing if it is negative then usually uh, what is recommended is test every five years mm. not every three years mm -hmm. so so there are all these methods which are available now when we do the um, the papa nicola or the pap smear as it is called and we find that there is a problem then the next thing we need to escalate this patient um, uh, for um, for what is called colposcopy and colposcopy is basically where we look at the cervix under magnification mm. and then we apply some solutions there mm. and because of the chemical changes that um, that take place we can actually pinpoint where there is a problem and we can take a little bit of that tissue, what is called a biopsy, which will be analyzed in a lab under a microscope. And then we can see whether uh, there is cancer, there is pre-cancer or there is cancer. And if there is cancer, at what stage it is. Mm -hmm. And then after that, obviously, we can uh, we can uh, do the appropriate appropriate treatment. Can, can any medic do any of these screenings or does it have to be a gynecologist? It doesn't have to be a gynecologist. Most of the time, actually, going through medical school, School, and this is what we teach our uh, our, our our medical students that um, uh, doing a gynecological exam is actually a part of part of doing a gynecological exam is getting um, you know tissue from from the cervix for for analysis. It's not only doctors; mm. even nurses actually uh, actually do this because remember we don't have doctors in every medical center in this yeah. country, mm -hmm. but we do have nurses in practically every every center even at the local dispensary yeah. so even nurses can actually do uh, a pap smear if you look dr terry at yes. the 90 70 and then treat all yes. the 90 is vaccine yes right yeah that's it's the first one on the list absolutely then the 70 is mm. the screening absolutely now the 90 mm -hmm right now in the country is being offered for free by government true that you take your child's your girl 9 to 14 she will get her first and second shot for free yes if you go to a private facility you get it for about 800 shillings yes so that is affordable very affordable because it's I would free say. yes you can you don't have to spend any money on it mm -hmm. the screening which would prevent you having to get this uh it, or at least make sure that even if you do have mm -hmm. this disease, it's very, very expensive. It's in the thousands of shillings. Yes. Why is that not possible then for the screening mm -hmm. to be made cheaper? From what you see, is it not possible for that to happen? Because if it were made cheaper, I mean, we also see that with care-seeking behavior, yes. that personal testimonials mm -hmm. often spur people on towards care-seeking. Care that is true. So most times, if somebody hears what well, somebody else had it, and if they had screened, mm -hmm. they may have been able to catch it earlier. Yes. But the prohibitive thing here mm -hmm. is the cost of the screening. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's possible to have made this vaccine mm -hmm. affordable at zero, mm -hmm. but then the screening is still so expensive? I think there are two there are two things we are looking at here. First of all, the ninety uh, the ninety seventy ninety strategy. The ninety is for uh, fifteen year olds mm -hmm. or young girls, for mm -hmm. that matter. The assumption here is that um, by that time they have not started having intercourse. Yes. Remember, from the time they start having intercourse, and let us assume. By the way, um, most women can and will get infected with H HPV virus, but the immune system will get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, but in some cases whereby, for example, if the immune system is not you know, up to date, then 
the HPV will, you know, get into the into into the cells, take over the normal function of the cells, mm. and after a long period of time, about 15 years, um, that is when actually we start seeing the signs of the cervical cancer. That is why the emphasis is on the prophylaxis of these young girls who have not started having intercourse, such that by the time they do start um, uh, f or, uh, further down the road, mm. the chances of them having this will be uh, having cervical cancer will be a lot lot less. Mm. I hear you and I totally agree with you that actually we should have sort of a national vaccination program um, whereby most women or all women should have this. And then um, the other question that comes up is um, what about women who have started having intercourse? I've mm. had intercourse yes. before. Do they also, can they also have um, this vaccine? Yes, they can. Why? Because there is a chance that even if they've started having intercourse, they have not been infected by the HPV. Mm. So this can also be can also be protective. So I think yes, that is that is one thing that we, uh, all of us, should advocate for. Mm -hmm. And then the health economists can come and help us in terms of costs and maybe get a program by the government such that we we roll out a national vaccine program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned um, the issue about it being free and uh, these girls can get vaccinated and so on. The other day I was talking to one of um, um, uh, Dr. Mecca who is um, in the National Vaccines Program in the Ministry of Health. And there is a challenge in actually getting these girls vaccinated mm. simply because of several things. Number one, there is that stigma. Number mm -hmm. two, parents think that by the time if we allow our young girls to get vaccinated, then we are opening the gate to promiscuity and so on, which is absolutely not true. Mm. No. But um, there are these barriers, the social, uh, cultural, maybe even religious barriers, mm. which we need to break. The other question was on uh, the affordability mm. of screening. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yes, uh, when uh, we do the screen, for example, if you do it in um, uh, in the private in the private sector, the pap smear costs about anywhere between a thousand five hundred to three to three thousand shillings. Yeah. In the um, in the public hospitals, it, it could be a lot a lot cheaper. Mm. So I think we should uh, we could even ch shift sort of um, uh, if we had um, a screening program mm. by the government, it would be a lot lot Through cheaper NHIS. in Absolutely. terms in terms of numbers. Mm through NHIF, that is number one. And then uh, maybe the insurance sector could also, uh, could also come in and also help. And if we do this, then maybe we'll actually be sort of um, having a, maybe a two, maybe three pronged approach mm -hmm. to, um, to re reducing the numbers. What some other countries did, especially in European Scandinavian countries, is that they made it mandatory such that any, uh, any lady, um, and because they have a very, a very, a very, very organized system. Uh, they know where uh, Ndu lives mm -hmm. and they know when Ndu is supposed to have you know, her, uh, her, her, her screening and they send you information and if you don't, don't, don't come up for the, for the whatever, they call you. Mm -hmm. They say, do you know what? You are, you are your screening for. is, up, is mm -hmm. up to date. What is happening? Have you had it done? And uh, they went a little bit further. Even when uh, uh, ladies were getting, you know, uh, getting employed, it was part of the things, the checklist. Mm. Have you had your mm. pap smear done? Mm. And because of this, they caught so many of them until uh, they have actually reduced all, almost to zero. Mm. And maybe that is something that we can actually do um, with, uh, do, with the government. You, why are you saying maybe you, you are the president of the Obstetrical and Gynecological <laughs> Society? Is this something that the society is putting in a program for advocacy. This is something that we are doing. This is something that we are talking about. Mm. But you see, as a society, there are so many other things that we don't have. How would you, how would you as a society, because now you're bringing in the people who know these things, who yes. you're dealing with these cases on a daily basis, how would you push that advocacy with government? I think it's, uh, the first thing is to talk with, um, uh, with the Ministry of Health. Um, the Ministry of Health has a department which, um, which can push this. That is number one. Number two, we would need to involve um, the NHIF and then, of course, make sure that um, in all um, uh, places, in all the health centers where women are seen, when the women come even for other, other reasons, mm -hmm. they come for ANC, for the antenatal you know, or checkups, mm -hmm. They can also have this inculcated in the uh, in the program, mm. and even if they come, they have other problems. For example, high blood pressure and so on and so forth. Maybe this is something which can also be sort of inculcated in That's the system. Carrying. All those things sound like things that are doable. None of them is costly. If it's about access to the Ministry of Health, you have access. 
If it's about NHIF, you have access to NHIF. I don't have access, but I can get access. Yeah, you're the president <laughs> of the society. If it's about data, you have the data and the yes. information. And the government also is the repository of these data. So you don't be telling them anything new. Yes. So how long before we actually hear that these meetings have taken place between the society advocating for this with NHIF, with the Ministry of Health, with counties? Um, uh, I think there is a mechanism which we, we will try and, and, and put in place. As you say, meeting with the minister. I have contact with, um, um, with the powers that be who are uh, in the family, fam family division of, um, um, uh, of, in the Ministry of Health. So this is something that um, uh, we are looking at. Um, then we need to bring in the other, the other players, you know, the NHIF um, and so on. Mm. So I think this is something that we can really, really uh, push. And of course, you can also help us, you know, um, as, as journalists to, say, you know, mm. to spread, spread the word mm. and also quote unquote put pressure okay can we say that well? and this mm. is now for, for everybody to know that by the time we are celebrating I mean, or we are marking cervical cancer awareness month in 2024 we'll be talking about a report from the gynecology society saying this is how far we've gone come back here use this platform let's talk i right? think we can we can do that because i mean it, it, you 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 are talking about nine women dying every, every, day, every day in this country yes. for something that could be prevented. Absolutely. It's about time we take action. Thank you very much. Yes, take that is a challenge yeah. and we will take the lead. Let me ask Definitely. This question, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, let me just uh, piggyback on Eric's question. Mm -hmm. um, the medical fraternity mm -hmm. in this country, do we consider health workers who are not medical doctors, nurses, clinical officers, lab technicians, do we consider them to be? Um, Separate disciplines, distinct disciplines, or are they adjuncts to the medical doctors? What are they? Are they support staff or are they distinct disciplines? I think they are distinct disciplines because what uh, the nurse does, I don't do. But uh, what, uh, what the nurses do, the midwives do, you know, the, the lab technologies do, they complement what we are supposed to be doing in order to help the patient, you know, to roll out healthcare. So they are not... Um, uh, what they they complement. They complement. We work together because yes. we the, cannot. The, the, we cannot. So the, the functions something. are complementary. Yes. Now, in your association, mm -hmm. how do you have these other cadres of the health fraternity as members of your association? Yes, we do yes. as uh, associate members. Why? Um, uh, because according to our constitution, and that is how it was, um, uh, it was done, um, uh, we can have, even you can be an associate of, um, uh, of our Kenyan Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. Anybody else who has an interest in reproductive health can be um, a member, an associate member as well. Sure, I'm going with this, huh? Mm -hmm. When anyone goes to a health facility, mm -hmm. they are very unlikely, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely the first person they'll contact is a medical doctor. Yes. These are the health practitioners that they encounter. Yes. Now, if they are the people who are in abundance in our health facilities, yes. and now we've thrown in the role of uh, what we call community health workers, yes. the knowledge that we speak of, how much effort have we put into cascading this knowledge so that the people who are in touch with the very, very, very individual that we are speaking of yes. can actually have direct access to this knowledge that they need in order to prevent this very preventable occurrence that we refer to as cancer. Yes. This knowledge, talking about cervical cancer, yes. and um, you're talking about the nurses, you know, the midwives who are on the ground and the yes. community health workers. Community health workers may not be uh, uh, trained to actually um, do the, the pap smears and so on. But uh, the nurses are, are trained to do that, and they, are all, they also have this knowledge, and they do know that if they see something that they which is beyond their their training they are supposed to cascade it that is where uh, that is where we come in as doctors even i myself as a, uh, as a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist when i see a patient who has cervical cancer mm. um, uh, in order for her to get proper 
proper treatment, I send her to a gynae oncologist because these are these these are colleagues who have subspecialized and they actually deal with these with these uh, uh, diseases and they give the best care the, the best care possible. So yes, there is that cascading, and yes, there is this information which has been um, given to these um, other cutters, and um, uh, they uh, and yes, that, is, that that is what is supposed to be done. The community health workers, yes. May, yes, they are not trained to treat or even to provide health assistance, but they can pass on the message and syndromically Absolutely. they can be trained to diagnose and say, you know, look, if you think this is happening or if you see this, the next step is this. And one, being community health workers, not only are they in touch, but they're the people whom the community is mo are most likely to come to. Totally agree with you. Yes. But then by the time uh, a lady says, you know what, I've been having this discharge, I've been having this smell, mm. it is too late. Mm. It is stage three, stage four. Mm. That is why the emphasis is on prophylaxis, yeah. on uh, screening. So such that by that we don't want to get that stage whereby um, kuna 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 wundo unatoka hapa, you know, mm, and so on. That there's something but wrong. But there is something there's something wrong. Mm. So the emphasis is to yes, use the community health workers because they are the ones who are the community health sort of more trust, and the community health work can tell the community say, look, guys, please come for screening. screening. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So, okay, sure. I mean, of course, prophylaxis is what we're talking about. Preventative care. Um, that those though who unfortunately will be caught in the net of having already been found with cervical cancer yes. and then require some kind of treatment. Unfortunately, from statistics, we've seen that most cases are caught at stage three, stage four because mm -hmm. of the silence of this. Yes. What is the treatment recourse? And in terms of what exactly happens, how many lives are you able to save at the point of treatment? Mm -hmm. But for them to now either one go into remission or you know be cleared completely, what what numbers are we looking at in, able to, in being able to save lives and what does the treatment course look like? The treatment course will depend on uh, on the stage because when they come with um, uh, stage three, you know, um, uh, stage four, first of all we uh, we take them and we want to stage the disease mm -hmm. um, by uh, taking them to theatre, examining them, getting a biopsy, and. Um, uh, getting to know which type of cancer it is because the treatment will also depend on which type of cancer um, uh, it is. Now, um, remember that by the time they come to uh, uh, to us with this stage 3, stage 4, there are other issues as well. Most of the time they have been bleeding, they are anemic, you know, um, um, the immune system is not doing very well, um, and so on and so forth. So we want to, first of all, optimize the function of the body. We have a big problem with blood in this country, unfortunately. Mm. Um, because some of these patients come to hospital and they stay for three days, four days, five days, sometimes a week. We need three, four, five units, we get one unit, for example. So this leads to a delay mm. in uh, in the treatment. But let's assume that they have come and they have got this blood and, and so on. Um, the first thing we want to do is to try and stop this disease from spreading as far as possible. Yeah. Usually when it is stage three, stage four, we do not take them to theater to operate. We treat them by uh, radiotherapy and sometimes uh, chemotherapy. And um, depending on how far um, this uh, uh, disease is advanced, we actually do help them. But remember, if the, the, the disease has attacked, you know, the, the bladder, it has attacked the, 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 the ureters or the kidneys for that matter, there are other things also which we have to, uh, to involve. We have to get other experts as well, a multidisciplinary approach in order to optimize the, their treatment. Um, I still want to go back to that message saying we don't want to go to stage three, stage four, sure. because because the, by then there are so many other things which have come into play and it is so expensive because sometimes they have to go for dialysis mm. in order for us to op optimize the conditions for, 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 uh, to enable us to, uh, to treat them. So we go back to the screening, 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 and then uh, uh, it's also less expensive and it is a lot easier. Mm. So the message across the country is screening absolutely and it should be as voluntary as possible get up go to is it your nearest health facility nearest health facility and what yes. do you say um i've come for a screen for a, a pap smear. smear yes that's it that's it okay
Asante Asante sana daktari. <laughs> Asante sana. Karibu sana. The message is please let's all tell our sisters our mothers our daughters go for screening. Go for screening for the nearest health facility and say I've just come for a cervical cancer screening a pap smear. And, and it should it. be after the periods not during the periods because obviously that will not be able to be done. Okay. Mm. Dr. Kireki Umanua, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you for sharing this information. And yes, there is a commitment that we've uh, made here that uh, you use your office, open the doors, use your office, come here. Let's use the platform to create, create more and more awareness to the community and also to advocate for accessible screening services and cheaper screening services across the country. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Omanua is the president of the Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. He's been here in the, uh, in the studio this morning. We've been talking about cervical cancer. It's preventable via the HPV vaccine. Please go for the HPV vaccine as well. We're talking about nine women dying in Kenya every day from cervical cancer. And this could have been prevented if many of them got the vaccine.